They've got good drafts and got some pretty good talent in camp. If they uh, work hard and uh, get a few breaks here and there, I think they'll. Uh, I think they can wind up on top. I think they've concluded approximately three years of a building program, a major building program with smart minds, carefully planning what's to take place. This is the year. They're going to put it all together. I think they're going to take it all. Why? Because they're the best team in the NFL. They'll do fantastic. They've got a lot of support. It's nice to see everybody out here watching them train. It's a good sign. Chicago Bear fans set lofty goals for their team. The Bears of summer had ambitions, too. A goal they reached by making the playoffs. But against the eventual Super Bowl champion Cowboys, inexperienced Bears wore their hearts on their sleeves. But one bad day could not tarnish all the good ones. A young team with its stars ascending grew together, content that hopes and dreams forged in blazing summer heat were nearing realization. And in 1977, the Chicago Bears enjoyed a season in the sun. Though many experts had predicted a bright season for the Bears, the road that led to Texas Stadium was a difficult one. Chicago lost five of its first eight games, and the dreams of summer had given way to nightmares. They had been expected to win as a team. Instead, they struggled as a team, and too often, lost as a team. Searching for an identity, this young team developed a split personality. It wore two faces. The Bears seemed unable to decide which one they would wear at season's end. When they were good, they were very good. But in a showdown at Minnesota, the Vikings dug into their ageless bag of tricks to win in overtime. The Bears were left for dead in Houston. To be sure, playoff hopes were flagging. The pulse was weak and the breathing shallow. But the young die hard and the Bears would rally around their coach, Jack Pardee, and rededicate themselves to honor save. Youthful resiliency is a bear a lie as Chicago heads into the 1978 season. But ageless veteran Doug Buffon retraces the goal established by George Hallis. I really would like it before I could retire to someday to say, here, here's the game ball from the Super Bowl. You know, you once had the monsters of the midway, and here's the, here's the, the new bears. You know, you've had them both, you know, and I, I just hope maybe someday it'll happen. Overcoming an Achilles injury that has ended many a career, dedication and sacrifice are the lessons Buffon's play has brought home to his teammates. That same dedication to winning was apparent in general manager Jim Fink's exhaustive search for a playoff experienced head coach. The man he picked to lead the Bears has been in title games in 11 of his 14 National Football League seasons. He has the qualities that I'm sure that you have to have to succeed in this business, and uh, I'm very pleased and proud to present to you our new football coach, Neil Armstrong. Neil? I know one thing we're going to do. We're going to work hard, because I don't think that uh, anything in this game is easy. And we're going to get the people that can teach. But I think particularly when you have a team that is young as the Bears are, you need some people that can teach. You can't expect to throw the football out there and, uh, and let them play, and let them play on their own. So we're going to be teachers. That, uh, that's my philosophy as far as anything in football is concerned. In Chicago, teaching is a prime concern. 
than 17 of the Bears' 22 starters have played three or fewer NFL seasons. Many young Bears spend their first seasons running under Bob Thomas kickoffs and Bob Parsons punts. Special teams duty that affords the opportunity to make significant contributions as coverage specialists and kick returners. Art Best, Vince Evans, Mike Spivey, Len Waldescheid and number 84, Brian Bashnagel were among players who made their presence felt as a cohesive unit where teamwork is vital. But the star of Chicago's special teams was number 85, Steve Schubert, who always seemed to be making a big play. The Bears didn't draft Schubert. He's one of 14 free agents who have signed on with Chicago. Two others have become outstanding starters. One was wide receiver James Scott, who burned secondaries for 50 receptions in 1977. Scott was a free agent starter on offense. Gary Fensick, number 45, won a starting job in the secondary and made all the right plays on defense. Finding free agent gems like Schubert, Scott, and Fensick is as important to winners as finding good depth. Winners need depth. Number 75, Jeff Seavey, began the season protecting his own quarterback, but finished it chasing down the opponents, as injuries cost the Bears defensive end Roger Stilwell and tackle Wally Chambers. A trade brought in number 87, Billy Newsom the team at defensive end with three-year pro Mike Hardenstein, number 73. Jerry Myers backed up the starting tackles, Ron Rydelt, number 76, whose first line in the Bear press book reads, breaks quarterbacks, dot, dot, dot and Jim Osborne, number 68, whose nickname is Jaws. There was depth at linebacker two, number 57, Don Reeves, and number 58, Jerry Muckensturm. Both have starting experience. Tom Hicks, number 54, became the starting middle linebacker after midseason and played a key role in the Bears' late season drive to the playoffs. But among the linebackers, the sharpest pain in the pocket was Wayman Bryant, number 50. Persistent pressure by linebackers and linemen forced foolish passes for the Shocks in the secondary to feed on. Number 46, Doug Plank, joined Fenzik at safety. While on the corners, number 24, Virgil Livers, was all over the field. And Alan Ellis, number 48, stretched his 5'10 frame into the Pro Bowl while finishing second in the conference in interceptions. The players who could provide the defensive ignition that starts Bear rallies were there. They had only to prove it.
And this they did over the last five games in 1977. All must-win situations in which the Chicago Bear defense allowed a total of two touchdowns. Eleven stickers stopped the opposition cold and handed the ball over to the NFL Player of the Year, Walter Payton. Walter Payton, Gail Sayers. Only a master critic could have separated the smoothness of Sayers from the power of Payton as Walter blazed a breathtaking trail across the lake. Payton did not gain over 1,800 yards by simply running over a chalk-striped field. He squirmed and he clawed and he butted and he scratched. And Walter Payton fought for every inch along the way. even a back as talented as Walter Payton does not do it alone. And yet on most teams, the men who spring the sprinters are largely a faceless crew who toil in obscurity. Numbers on page 35 of the program. But put a man in the record book and folks get to know your name. Noah Jackson, left guard, University of Tampa, Jacksonville Beach, Florida. Really sorry, right guard, University of Illinois, New York City. Dan Pfeiffer, center, Southeast Missouri State from Harper, Iowa. Ted Albrecht, offensive left tackle, University of California, Berkeley. Dennis Lick, right tackle, University of Wisconsin. Greg Ladder, tight end, Morgan State University, Newark, New Jersey. Offensive line play is a sophisticated endeavor. It may not take a Harvard graduate like Dan Jiggetts, but he, Fred Dean, Dan Neal, and the starters know their business and love to block for backs like Peyton. For one thing, they know bare backs will make the most of the cracks or chasms they create. For another, intelligent running backs make linemen's jobs easier. Linemen and running back can count on each other. Run up the gut and they know Dan Piper will be there to wall off the middle linebacker. Get past the line and there's rookie tackle Ted Albrecht throwing a killer block downfield. Albrecht is often the weak side tackle, 
for the Bears favor a right side attack. Tackle Dennis Lick, number 70, handles his man, and room at the corner is created by either all NFC guard Reevy Sori, number 69, or Noah Jackson, number 65. Add the blocking of number 35 running back Roland Harper, and the sum often equals six. In 1977, Bob Avellini began his third year as a starting quarterback. Each season has been better than the last. With improving protection and confidence, Avellini is the bare offensive arm, throwing to receivers like number 80, Bo Rather. The bare passing attack also involves running backs, making good use of number 22, Johnny Musso. 240-pound rookie fullback Robin Earl, number 39, and a fellow named Peyton. In Peyton's shadow, number 35, Roland Harper is Mr. Versatility in Chicago. Harper is a fine receiver coming out of the backfield and a punishing runner in his own right. Harper has become one of the finest blocking backs in the league, a Chicago Bear who has developed other skills for the good of the team. The same can be said of Avellini who now uses his strong right arm only when the situation calls for it. And of tight end, Greg Latta, number 88, who improved his blocking skills to go with his already formidable pass-catching talent. Avellini and Latta would play a major role in the Bears' uphill climb to the playoffs. Against Kansas City in the ninth week of the season, Chicago's record was a dismal three and five. Trailing the Chiefs 27-21, the Bears found themselves just three seconds from the end of their rope. WBBM's Joe McConnell called the Bears' last shot. Wide to the near side, Deuce backfield, Avalini back to throw on the first count, sets up deep, now throws it long, down the left side, open, he's let up, he's got it! It was the play all of Chicago had been waiting for. With elimination from the playoffs just a heartbeat away, and by the margin of one scant point, the Bears stayed alive. From the freshest faced rookie to the grisliest veteran, they would do whatever it takes and from that day on would be on fire. The flame was fueled by Jack Pardee and burned within each Bear player. A critical rematch with Minnesota was next, and when the Bear offensive line finished work that day, Walla Payton had compiled an NFL record 275 yards, and Chicago had won a big one. But more important than the record was the fact that the Bears had moved to within one game of first place. They had established a pipeline to the playoffs, and Walter Payton had a shot at O.J. Simpson's rushing record of 2,003 yards. The highway opened by the Bear offensive line was called Ride 38, and ride it they did. It calls for the left side to cut their men at the line 
and leaves four blockers wall of Peyton into the end zone. On the blackboard, it looks antiseptic, but the same play looks a good deal more awesome to the unfortunate cornerback who stands between touchdown and number 69, Reeve Sore. A variation of ride 38 puts number 65, Noah Jackson, in the role of cornerback destroyer and worked equally well against Detroit the next week. In a 31-14 victory, Payton rushed for 137 yards. Tampa Bay fell the next week as Payton added another 100 to the record chase. And the Bears finally caught Minnesota with a 21-10 victory over the Packers when Payton added 163 yards to the growing total. Going into the final game of the season, the Bears had won five straight and had two goals clearly defined. A victory over the Giants would put them into the playoffs, and 194 yards would put Walter Payton into the NFL record books again. One clearly carried more weight. Sure, it's in the back of our mind, 2004, but I think all 45 guys in the squad want the W before anything else, and Walter would be the first guy to tell you. Super Bowl is what we're striving for. I know Walter is too, and individual goals are fine. But I know he's in our corner, we're in his, and, and Super Bowl, that's what we want. And so it's especially pleasing uh, for me, you know, being from Chicago and realizing what the fans have gone through to finally give them a, a team that has a chance to uh, win a championship. In the Meadowlands, the field was better suited to a Stan Makita breakaway than a Walter Payton touchdown run. But the 9-5 and five record that would put the team into the playoffs was far more important than an individual record. Horrendous conditions foiled Peyton and befuddled both teams. But Mother Nature saved her ugliest tricks for the Bear special teams. Snapper, holder, and kicker faced almost impossible tasks and tied at nine. The game ended overtime. It would continue until one team scored or 15 minutes had been played. At that point, the game would end in a tie and Chicago season would be over. So like a pack of resolute sled dogs, the Bears moved into the blizzard again. With just over three minutes to go, the field goal team missed connections again. But the misfortune only deepened the Bears' resolve. And when Chicago got the ball back, only 82 seconds separated the Chicago Bears from success or failure. There's the snap, it's a good one. Thomas puts it in the air. It's good! The Bears are in the playoffs! The Bears are in the playoffs! The Bears are in the playoffs! Bob Thomas must be right now.